I didn't say the book of Revelations, because that's not the name of it. <clears throat> the book of Revelation. And we are in, um, where are we? Chapter 2. Yeah. Chapter 2 and verse 18. And we actually had gotten about halfway through Thyatira. <clears throat> and um, so I am going to read this one again um, just so that we can remember what it was talking about. And before I re read it, <clears throat> I want to remind you that there are things written here that are clues to the meaning of the book of Revelation. They're not found in prophecy. The meaning isn't found in prophecy. <clears throat> but there's a certain element that has been being put forth from the beginning. And that element um, will follow all the way through these letters. The one thing to remember is this book was written to the seven churches over a specific need that they had. All right, verse 18, Revelation 2. And unto the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know thy works and love and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou allowest that woman Jezebel who calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants and to commit fornication and to eat those things sacrificed to idols which we talked about last class and we referred it to 1 Corinthians 8 chapter, or 1 Corinthians, yeah, chapter 8, Romans 14. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into bed, and them that commit adulteries with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill their children with death, and all of the churches shall know that I am he who searcheth the minds and hearts. I will give unto every one of you according to your works, and unto you I say, unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and who have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you no other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, um, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken in shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. All right. Again, you have the <clears throat> he that overcometh. And um, it will be later on in our lesson that we begin to recognize the full meaning because the meaning is tied with several other things to give a broad picture of what the Holy Spirit saith to the churches. <clears throat> um, also, if you'll notice here that it talks about um, the depths of Satan. Wow. The depths of Satan. Um, anybody remember um, in Pergamum, the one before this, that it talked about that they dwell where Satan's throne is. Okay, so here these guys are have the depths of Satan that they're having to deal with. Pergamum dwelt where the throne of Satan was, and Smyrna um, was dealing with blasphemy and those of the synagogue of Satan. Uh, now that's, that's a lot of devil there. It's a lot of the enemy. 
And, and yet, and yet, this is all very significant in a good way. <laughs> and uh, we're not quite there yet. But it is all very significant that these are the situations that's going on. And of course, we did allude to the fact that most Christians, <clears throat> their theology is that everything has to turn out wonderful and you always have to be on, on top and triumphant and in victory and, and uh, you really should never have any problems and you should walk above all the problems and you know, stuff like that. And, and I, you know, just off the cuff here, I say if that's the case, then you're never really gonna learn Jesus. You know, you're not gonna learn him. You might learn about him, but you're not going to learn him. <clears throat> um, so they're assailed with those problems. That, uh, let's see. Um, they have allowed Jezebel to teach and to seduce. Uh, it is in relationship to the depths of Satan. And the answer is, again, he that overcomes. <clears throat> All right, now again, the reason why I'm taking the time going through these churches is because uh, I, and I've, I've held this before the Lord before every double class when I come before in prayer, and I believe that the way that the Lord has given me to teach this is going to really open up like a flower once we get to a certain place. So I risk being a little boring right at first um, with the hope that the seeds are being planted that will really open this up. And, and again, if this was a, a movie premiere coming up, you should be excited. <laughs> I don't know if it'll be as good as Batman, but I just think it's going to be good. <clears throat> All right, let's go on to uh, Sardis. And... Um, Chapter 3 and verse 1. And um, Sardis uh, really, um, I mean, I'll look at it again as we go over, but Sardis seems to be um, a, kind of an amazing group of people because they don't really have any outside attacks coming against them. They have some inward things. And, and the thing that it says about Sardis is, is pretty long here. And under the angel of the church in, I'm sorry, did I say, yeah, Sardis. Sardis, write, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard <clears throat> and hold fast and repent. If therefore uh, thou shalt not watch, I will come unto thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a a few names, even in Sardis, that have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. <clears throat> All right. Um, no mention of uh, an external enemy here, but um, a very telling thing. He says, you have a name, but are dead. Okay, that means that you don't have the life of it, you have the name of it. You are it in name only, but not in life. Does that scare anybody? <laughs> and yet, and yet, if you're born again, you are born again of incorruptible seed, which is Christ. You have 
the life of Christ. It is not, you know, the problem is not with what you are. The problem is, is how you perceive yourself apart from Christ. Does that make sense? You, if your perception of yourself is based on you in your BC days, before Christ, then uh, you don't even realize that that person died. And you don't realize that with all that um, was part of that life, it died with that person. And now you have the life. But a lot of people are living according to religion and they're trying to be something apart from Christ. They're trying to be something apart from life. And the Father accepts the Son. That's why I put him in each and every person that's in the family. The Father accepts the Son. And so, again, that was their, that was their issue. Um, and their works are not perfect. And let's see what else I wrote down. They had defiled their garments. Okay, so this is very different than the last, actually the last three churches who, you know, some dwelt where Satan dwelt and others, you know, were around the synagogue of Satan and others, uh, some of them knew the depths of Satan. These guys um, have a completely different problem. And yet, the answer is said to be, regardless of the problem, he that overcometh. So this, this has got to be, there's got to be something to it. And it's got to be more than cliches and religion and talk and um, people trying and people, you know, reading their Bible and going to church all just for the purpose of trying to, you know, not have a guilty conscience or feel good about themselves or be something apart from Christ. So in this place if it's bible school it's not bible school it's christ it is lord form your son in me lord don't uh, you know don't teach me you know uh, we have no lack of teaching around this place i don't think anybody really needs to be taught anymore i think in a certain sense we need to learn what we've been taught but, you know, some people, I'm joking here, some people want to know why all I ever talk about is Christ and Him crucified. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, but that's because we don't need any more teaching. We need Jesus. We need the real Jesus. We don't need to just look good, have a name, but n don't live it. We don't need to, to dress a certain way to please people or, or try to uh, show up and, you know, walk or talk a certain way to please people. Uh, you know, our, our church is full of a huge variety. And I love that because it says that we must be getting hold of the real thing because nobody's trying to conform to everybody else and look the same way, you know. <clears throat> and... Um, when it's all said and done, folks, we're all going to be before Jesus. That's it. So the question is, let's be, you know, can we be before him now? You see what I'm saying? I mean, people go, oh, I can't wait to get to heaven and be before Jesus. You can do that now. My God. You can have your heart right there. You can, you know, you can be shouting Glory to him right now, sitting right where you are, silently glorifying the Lord and just so glad that he's brought you into oneness with himself and, and uh, is showering you, not just here in these classes, but showering you with the truth. Um, but when you, when you get out into the system, and I, this time I'm not talking about the world system, this isn't the hippie Randy talking here, this is the, the Jesus Randy talking here, you get out in the religious system and it will affect you because it uh, breeds something. It breeds something. And it does it 
um, without, um, like, for example, here, we encourage you to keep your heart after God, no matter what, up, down, just stay after the Lord, no matter, you fail, get up and keep your eyes on Jesus. You know, some, some churches teach, if you sin, if you fail, that's it, you know. The, you know, God doesn't want anything to do with you. How utterly stupid. The one person that you should go to and go to freely and come boldly is the Lord. And yet they're telling you God doesn't like you, doesn't love you anymore. It's over with until you get right. And you, well, you can't get right before you come to him. He's what being right is, <laughs> you know. And let him cleanse your conscience with the reality that he, remember we talked about this last class, cleansing your conscience. Um, and so, uh, the, the answer is always going to be Jesus. Now how that, how that plays out sometimes can look different, but it's always going to be Jesus. To these who have a name, but they don't live it, he says the same thing to all the others. He that overcometh. And then he says, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. See, now, when you hear that, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Immediately in your heart, you say, Lord, you know, I don't know fully what's being said. I'm not going to go into condemnation over it. I am going to believe that you are going to break the bread of life. I mean, you remember Jesus said in John 10, he says, uh, uh, I am the good shepherd and my sheep, I, I'm the door and I do this. You remember he talked about being the door and all, and all this stuff. And you are my sheep and I call you by name. And he ended it with, um, and my sheep know my voice. And the next verse after that says, and they understood not those things that he said to them. Yeah, that's what it says. And if that was some of us, We'd go, oh my God, he just spelled it out. And if, if we were, if we knew his voice, then, then we're his and I must be a, I must be a black sheep or, or worse than that, I'm a wolf. You know, I, you know, all the junk we go through. I try not to know all the stuff, you know. <laughs> but, <clears throat> But we do. We go through all of those things and we worry and we fret and we, we take it at face value instead of looking into the face. You understand? We take the scriptures at face value without looking into his face. So the scripture just said, my sheep know my voice. And then when he gets through talking, the disciples, the disciples, it wasn't the multitude, it was the disciples said they understood not those things that he said. So what are they going to do? Fall in a heap and just start whining and kicking and, you know, oh my God, you know, and going through stuff they don't even have to go through. Or they can know his face and know his heart and know he's made you one by the cross, not by your works that you have done, but by his death on the cross. Made you one, secured you by making you one. Settling it in his heart, rising from the dead with you in him and with him. And then we go, oh, I didn't understand what he was talking about. Oh no. And we start going through mountains of stuff that we, that it's just, you know, it's, it's a waste of time. I don't want to say it's foolish because in the, in my heart, and as a, as a shepherd, I know that that's hard on people. And I don't want anybody to go through that. And I don't want to join in and berate those who go through it. But on the other hand, it really is a waste of time. You're already one. You walk in that throne room and act like you're one, and he'll act like it back. Prodigal son, remember? We talked about 
Okay? So, all right, let's move on to Philadelphia. Now, this, this church at Philadelphia is spoken of the most highly of all of them. Philadelphia means brotherly love, city of brotherly love. Now, I don't really think that Philadelphia here in the United States is that way. At least the Eagles fans aren't. <laughs> but nonetheless, we defer to them and love them. She's full of brotherly love because of Christ. That's why she likes the cowboys too. Right, Izzy? <gasps> Uh-oh, there it goes, see? There you go. See, it just depends on which city you're from. <laughs> just teasing. All right, let's read. Um... And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. <clears throat> Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. There's, again, a mention of Satan. <clears throat> synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, and do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crowns. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. All right. So he says to those of the city of Philadelphia, I will write my, the name of my city on you, which is New Jerusalem. So he's saying you need to leave the city of Philadelphia and... <laughs> Kidding again, just teasing as he. But, but let's face it, brotherly love, the word in, in Greek is phileo. God's word for love is agape, and phileo is where you get that kind of love. It's a soulish love. It's not Christ, because God is agape. God is love, right? It's a different, there's a difference there. And in truth, the spirit of this is, is that he does want them to leave that city, and he's going to ride upon them New Jerusalem, which is what? Another city? It's the bride of Christ. And you see that towards the end of the book, and no need explaining that right now, but... It is another heart. It's a whole other thing. It's not just loving your brothers or your sisters or stuff like that. It's, first of all, loving the Lord so much that we join to him so much that what he is, we become. That's what bride is. Um, and so um, the only real problems it says is that uh, that you have a little strength <clears throat> but I don't know that that's a problem because there's another another word for having a little strength and it's called being weak anybody remember anything out of first Corinthians the first chapter that he had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the wise and that um, uh, that the weakness of God is stronger than men. Okay. Uh, so, um, and then 
um, uh, again, they have um, this situation, which uh, one of the others, and I don't remember which one it is right now, but they're being assailed by those of the synagogue of Satan. And it's funny because in both of my notes, my last two ones, when I wrote down the synagogue of Satan or the depths of Satan, I wrote down, and I typed it up, assailed by the synagogue of Stan. So if you run into a guy named Stan, look out. <laughs> All right. So that's the outward problem. What's the inward problems that they have? He really doesn't address any, any bad thing going on inside of them. He doesn't say, well, I, I do have this against you. You know, wouldn't that be nice? <clears throat> but, but it's not good to compare because they're all one church. And even if you have stuff wrong, that can be the diving board, the platform for growing in the Lord. You know, you learn more in a crisis than you do in blessing. That's just a fact. That's just a fact. You know, you'll learn more of the Lord. You know, that is if your heart's towards the Lord of that. And if it's not, <clears throat> then you're just sailing along. <clears throat> All right, let's try to get this last one done here, um, Laodicea, and we'll finish out the chapter also. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea, <clears throat> oh, by the way, the, the name Laodicea means people's rights. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write, these things saith the Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. <clears throat> I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee <clears throat> to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear, hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. <clears throat> All right. So uh, he doesn't really mention outward problems here. It's all this inward thing, neither hot or cold. They're self-satisfied, naked and blind. <clears throat> it's interesting how it's worded in verse 17, because thou sayest, because thou sayest. Um, you know, there's some churches that, you know, you, you try to confess everything into existence. And I believe there's some, I believe there's merit. I don't believe it, there's magic, but I believe there's merit in saying what the Lord says. And the word confess is the Greek word to say with, to say with God what God says. We say, okay, I gotta confess, you know, and, you know, Catholics, oh, I gotta confess, meaning I've gotta tell somebody everything that's wrong, everything I've done, thought, or, you know, plan on thinking. <clears throat> <clears throat> and <clears throat> you're not saying with God, you're saying with the devil, or you're saying with your flesh. True confession is to say with 
God, to say what God says, to say what God says about you, to, to say, to, to believe it and to say it and to stop saying the opposite of what God says about you, you know. If you're going to say, well, I'm nothing, then say, I'm nothing, but Jesus is my everything and he lives in me and, and I have fullness. You, you see what I'm saying? Um, and, and I, you know, and I know these things. I personally know these things, man. I've had to go through all kinds of stuff, but I've had to learn to say with. I've had to learn that there was nothing magic in confession. It's just that when you're, you do say it, it's a manifestation of what you believe in your heart. Because we believe, therefore we speak. That's what the scriptures say. So, um, <clears throat> You know, some people say, well, you speak it into being, you know, and I could go through the scriptures that they use and show you that that is not what it says, you know. It is not. It's not what it says. And, and it's just, you know, again, if people would just read what it says and look at it, but they were told this, then they look at it and they read it into that. And if you don't learn anything else in the Bible school, in the church here, in visiting, in anything else, if you don't learn anything else, learn to read the Bible and not read what people have taught you that it says. How are you ever going to know the truth? You know, you, you know, you can't base knowing the truth on me or anybody else around here or anybody else in any other church. You know, I do my best to point you to the truth, but I got news for you. I, I am not batting a thousand. I, I don't, I mean, I am not. I know that everything that I think right now is the truth is not necessarily the truth. But I got sense enough to point you to Jesus, to point you to the Holy Spirit, because he knows the truth. But the difference is someone might do that in some other church, but, but I want to make sure that I follow up with now do it. You know what I mean? Now do it. When you leave here, spend some time in the Word. You know, what I do, honestly, what I do is I just, I don't try to read real fast. I mean, when I was first born again, I would go, oh, I'm gonna, I read the whole book of, you know, um, Leviticus in one afternoon. Well, how much do you remember of that? You know. Well, something about killing something, you know, in a fire, uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. Man, I would rather read five words, take my time, and have, you know, as I do, have the Holy Spirit, who is my teacher. Uh, he's in me, but I always feel like he's like right here looking over my shoulder going, you know, I'll read and he'll go, ah, he just read over something. I go, what? I'll read it again. I go, there's nothing there. <laughs> and he'll go, ah, I can look a little closer. You know, and he doesn't say these words, but it, that's what he does with me. And, and I'll go, oh my God, look right here. I always thought that said so-and-so because we do that. You know, I mean, I've given examples before of my Bibles where I would write notes in and everything. And I remember I, I was still in Bible school and, and been, been in school for a couple of years. And, and my Bible was just full of notes and everything. And I always used a Bible like this. So you can see there's not much of a margin. So, margin, so there's just like notes everywhere. And one day I was reading my Bible and I got to a section with all these notes. And I automatically read over it and I said, well, I already know what that says. And what I knew was everything I had written. Did you know that there's probably more there that you don't know? And I'm talking about me now, okay. <laughs> there's actually, he could actually show you something new in the same scriptures that he's really wise and you're not. <laughs> And again, I was using my, I'm not, I'm the one who's got all these notes and things because I've filled up several margins that are so thin you can only get a couple of sentences in there and he is the wisdom of the ages, the ancient of days, the beginning and the end. Oh, I've got this, these two pages figured out. No. I want to know the Lord, then why would I do that? 
you understand, I'm still talking to myself. I want to know the Lord, so why would I do that? Why would I skip over? Why would I assume that I already know what that's talking about completely? Why wouldn't I say, you know, and, well, here's what I did. I shut that Bible. I went and bought me a brand new Bible and said, let's start over. <laughs> and uh, came back to that same spot and said, okay. What do you think? <laughs> and he goes, well, you really want to know? Yeah. Well, you remember that what I shared with you earlier? Yeah. That was about three years ago, and you've actually grown since then. And I was feeding you baby food back then. Look what it really says. And you go, oh, my God. Thank you, Lord. I never would have known that. I'd have had a Bible full of baby food. Oh, look. I remember when I splattered, you know, uh, string greens or whatever they're called, you know. <laughs> You know, all over here. And, and look, I, I, you know, and I'm trying to think of some. Of the, I, I remember what they looked like, you know. Yeah, 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 squa yeah, squashed, all this stuff and peas. And it's like, oh, look how beautiful this is, you know. The father's going, it's baby food all over here, you know. And so it's a heart condition. You know, it's a heart condition. Nobody can convince you of that. Um, we've had students come here for three years and study and pass, make passing grades and graduate and go out of here and never had a heart that said, you know what, I don't want a, I don't want a diploma that's pretty much, you know, worth, you know, this right here. Uh, you know, uh, worth nothing, and uh, and even if it's worth something, it's still not worth giving up the Lord. This is a precious time. Use it. Soak in the Lord. Go after the Lord. Seek the Lord while He may be found. You know. <clears throat> anyway, sorry. This is your pastor speaking. Fasten your seat belts. All right. Um, so Laodicea in verse 17, thou sayest, you see, I just read that, thou sayest, and I've been talking for 20 minutes on just that little bit. Thou, you, this is what you say, I am, I am, I am rich, and I am increased with goods and have need of nothing, and you don't even know that you're wretched, and you're miserable, and you're poor, and you're blind, and you're naked. And it would... You know, wouldn't that be a shocker? I'm just, you know, painting a picture here, but wouldn't it be a shocker to stand before the Lord and go, oh, baby, I'm going to get lots of rewards because I, I was increased with goods, and, man, nobody needed to work, for, you know, do stuff for me, man. I was really spiritual and all this kind of stuff. And he goes, you're naked and blind and miserable and what was that? that wretched. Wretched. Hey, wretched, miserable, come up front. I want to talk to you. You're, going, You're talking to me? What? Surely wretched and miserable is back behind me somewhere. There's a big multitude here. You know, and he goes, no, no, I wanted to talk to you. What's he going to talk to me about? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Calling me that? <clears throat> All right. So how do, how, do you, how do you keep that from happening? First of all, it's a combination of two things. In myself, I am wretched and miserable. As one with the Lord, I am one with Jesus. I am considered one with him. Now, the balance of that keeps you humble and hungry because if you just go, well, I'm the son of God, and I'm one with the Lord, and I'm, I'm a new creation, and I'm, I have need of nothing, and I'm rich. Oh, my God, I'm quoting this right here. And that's, I've heard Christians say that stuff, you know. We have need of nothing. You're rich, you know. And you go, you know, if you're talking about earth and all of that stuff, no, you're wretched and poor. Wretched and miserable. Okay. So that one part um, keeps you, I'm going to say it like this, but it's a good, I mean it in a good way, keeps you needy because you, 
always need the Lord. And yet you're always getting the Lord. And yet, you know, it's like, okay, well, Jesus is enough, but I can't get enough of Jesus. You know what I'm saying? That's a good way to look at it, isn't it? Let's write that down. Everybody write that down. <laughs> yes. The Lord, there's always a sense of a real deep lack all the time in us, whether it's seeing what's not Christ or being reduced to ashes or something, because ultimately the life of Jesus isn't me being rich and having all goods. Ultimately, it's for others anyway. I don't think we're always aware of the life that's going out when we're staying in that place. And if we're unaware that that's the way God works, we'll try and get out of that place. That's like how that's a failure to be needy and wretched and miserable, right. but it's really the state out of which Christ lives. Sure. You know, all the time. Paul said, when I am weak, then am I strong because his strength is made perfect in my weakness. Okay, so it's just an amazing balance of those things and yet it's a conundrum and yet it's, you know, <laughs> it's all of that. But it's, it's good to know that you're weak as long as you're turning and trusting in the Lord. You see what I mean? And it's good to know that you're hungry because you know that the Holy Spirit is going to feed you regularly. But, you know, it's like after you eat a big meal, you're not hungry. But wait a little while. You'll, you know, you'll be hungry again. You go, I'm hungry for Jesus. You know, I just, he shared some great stuff with me, but you don't go, well, I'm going to live off of that, that supper that I had for the next three months. You know, well, how's that working for you? Well, that's what the church is doing, you know. Um, three meals a day is healthy. <laughs> you know, I mean, isn't it, but I mean, just think about it. Isn't it strange that God made us to have to eat several times a day? Every day of your life, hunger is part of the deal. Well, that's a physical manifestation of a spiritual truth that you're supposed to maintain a certain level of hunger. And in fact, um, if you're eating regularly, then it's not going to be starvation hunger. You know, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've gone to places during conferences, for conferences in different places and, and people, you know, I, I've been there several times and somebody will come up to me and say, oh my God, that was so good what you just shared. I said, man, I'm so glad you're back here sharing again. I've been starving to death. And I said, you know, don't you have a Bible? You know, don't, they don't, they don't sell those up here, you know, <laughs> or something, you know, don't depend on someone to feed you. You see, that's a trap. It's good to get fed. A shepherd leads you to green pastures, but you have to eat. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's just a trap. I mean, there's a purpose for, you know, apostles and prophets, evangelists, all that. There's a purpose for all of that. But it is not to, um, you know, get a big old comfy chair and set you in it and then just feed you until you're so big the only way you could move is with a hover around you know and most of the people on them are you know larger the way i'm heading i can't exercise it's like i told ben he came over to do something because i I can't do anything. He came over to do something with an air conditioner and came down to the bedroom today and and uh, asked me if I'd been up and around. I said, I, I can't hardly move. And he said, uh, I said, you know, you're going to come back here in a year and I'm going to fill this whole bed. I'm going to be so bad. <laughs> so pray for me. <laughs> All right. Um, there's a lot of good stuff here, and this is ending up the thing. Um, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. <clears throat> um, he didn't say I counsel you to, to buy gold or to buy gold of me. 
God, I'm telling you this, I'm going to say it. Right, get ready. You, you won't. God finds value in gold that has been tried in the fire. It's more precious to him. It's more pure. It's more pure. It's, it's uh, more devoid of impurities because the fire burns some things off that nothing else, no amount of classes, no amount of church can, can do. First of all, the fire points out what's not gold and what's dross, you know. And so uh, that's important to, uh, to what we're talking about here, too. Um, uh, and then verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Amen. Gosh, we just go through such stuff, you know. It's like if the Lord said, okay, I'm not chastening you. I'm, I'm just talking in riddles. We go, oh, okay. But if he says, okay, I'm chastening you specifically. You. I'm chastening you. We go, what I, what I do, you know. Do you, you understand what I mean? We go through all this stuff. Okay. <laughs> and, um, um, but what if he said, okay, I'm loving you. Say, so, well, don't feel like I am. I'm loving you. You are? Yes, I am very much loving you. Really? Really? Can I get a hug? No. <laughs> I'm loving you right now. <laughs> Our Father is good. I'm sorry. I'm sorry people misread him. Um, I can't imagine what that must feel like. <clears throat> But our Father loves us, and He loves us enough um, to want us to function as one with Christ. He loves us enough to take us to Calvary, you know. There we go, see. Now we're scared, now we're off, now we don't understand what that means. And every word melts away because we don't understand God, we don't understand his heart. And only time and, and situations and the word and the spirit of God, only that can bring us to a true place of knowing him and not knowing him by what we perceive to be, you know, negative things. All right, so you're just going to have to trust the Lord and keep going. <laughs> That's all I can say. All right, and then verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And most of you know that that door is the door of the church. Remember in the first uh, chapter, he was in the midst of the seven candlesticks, which is the seven churches. You remember that? He was inside. Now he's outside knocking to get back in. And that's sort of what's happened with the modern day church. Jesus, they understood in the beginning that it was about Christ in you. They understood that and they lived by it and they taught it and it was exciting and it spread and you know all that kind of stuff. But nowadays to teach Christ in you, to teach the cross, that's just almost unheard of. And so they think you're strange because you're teaching something weird when in fact Jesus is knocking, trying to get back in where he belongs, where he wants to be. And we're looking up in the sky going, oh, Jesus. You know what I mean? Oh, wherever you are, we're Jews again. Because the Jews, he was far away. We're just Jews. No, you're not. 
yeah, you're far away. I hear a voice, but I don't know where it's coming from. He's in you. I tell people, you need to turn up the volume on your still small voice. <laughs> All right, so, um, and then I like the wording here. I stand at the door and knock. He's trying to get in and look at the, the words. I will come into him. He didn't say I'll come in through the door. I'll come into your house. Look at the words. It's really, really good stuff. I mean, you can... Mmm. Sweet. Sweet word. I will come into him. Not I will just come to you, or I will come back in the clouds, or I'll walk through the door of your heart, like we think, you know. Jesus... Here, Jesus is not knocking on the door of your heart to come in so that you can get saved. That's the way this scripture is most commonly quoted. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, an altar call. And Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. No, he's knocking on your church, buddy. <laughs> he's knocking on your heart. He's knocking on this place. He wants to be located inside of you. I was really thankful in Houston because of the language difference, I can't always nail it like I want to. Not that I can in English, but I, you know, it's even harder in Spanish. And um, um, at the very end, just before I was going to preach the last time, um, uh, I was just desiring a clearer dividing and and Patty got up there and they he invited the pastor invited Patty and Mike up there and you know they talked and stuff and and then Patty because she knows the language she just divided it and just to me it was like opening the Red Sea for him you know or the or the Jordan it's like yes it was good it was really good <clears throat> um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> the Lord wants to dwell in us and that's his feast I will come in and sup with you that's his feast to live in us that's, that makes him happy that makes him satisfied that makes him full and for all of the religion that is working so hard to teach us about a faraway God and teach us religious things so that the more religion we know, the more Christian we are. <clears throat> oh my God, no. You know, we're not supposed to. Uh, you know, John didn't say religion must increase and I must decrease. He said he must increase and I must decrease. So anyway, I'm going to stop there. That's the end of that chapter and the next one we should be able to start getting into this stuff so let's take a break